Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Rebels Masterclass. It's wonderful to have you all here. Thank you for coming along on this lovely evening. These are a part of a series of masterclasses that we've been running all the way from October all the way through to, and we run them every Thursday night in term time. We've got one more session this term, which is next week, so it's about Chicago Footwork, so definitely go and check that out. It'd be great to have you. We are keeping all these sessions free, and we hope to keep them as free as possible. So if you could go donate or if you can give anything, don't worry if not, but if you can give anything towards them, that'll be greatly appreciated. Well, that's enough about the plugs and the subtle plugs. It's now time to introduce the wonderful Ruth Reb, who is uh, sat with her current creation behind her. Hello. Hello. So Ruth is a theatre maker and designer who's been the heart and behind our hugely successful Back Alley Puppetry Parade. Um, Ruth has done lots of design work and worked for companies like The Bike Shed, Don Quixote, Design Costumes and Props. She works with the costume design for The Hunting of the Snark, which was designed by Timothy, and also the design costume, sorry, for D Timothy and the Tortoise. She also has been making giants with her family uh, with the Lost River Giants for years. So her parents started the Lost River Giants Parade 30 odd years ago is that right 32 32 <laughs> years ago this and so year. this year from, so from the hydro grasshopper roof has been building giant puppets and she helped with Zenitagni helped us create our back alley puppetry parade in a very short space of time last <laughs> September and the current creation behind you is building to another one which is coming up shortly but to give you a lot more insight on how to create these wonderful gorgeous huge giant puppets I'll hand over to the wonderful roof web and thank you for being here Ah, oh, thank you, James, and thank you, everybody else, for turning up. I wish I could see all of your faces. <laughs> oh, look, and there's another person. Hello. Um, okay, so I, I definitely want to show you this giant, and I want to tell you all about making, but I kind of felt that for lots of people, I don't know how much you know about giants, but for lots of people, they won't necessarily necessarily have spent much time in this world so I kind of wanted to give you a bit of an introduction a history and just to be honest show you some of the awesome giants that I really love um, so I'm going to do a little bit of a presentation just to um, yeah to get that started so hop bear with me I'm going to start screen sharing okay um, hooray we're there okay so I've uh, really concisely named this because uh, that's the kind of person I am I'm not a person that um, doesn't know how to use words or anything like that so some of the hows and what's are wise in the world of giant making okay so throughout history we humans we've lived alongside giants be they like the early gods in the Greek um, and Roman um, legends or creators of earthly chaos. They were beings responsible for volcanoes. They made mountains and even held up the earth. In the Celtic legends, stories are told of great giant battles. I just remembered I'm supposed to do the slide. <laughs> Here we go. Um, yeah, great giant battles in which they threw boulders from hill to hill, creating the moorlands that we see today. We fought alongside them and we fought them. They could be said to represent both the worst and sometimes the best sides of our humanity. At their best, they represent superhuman strengths, adventurous deeds, and they are protectors of the weak. And it's in this way that processional giants are really used. So towns and cities have quite often used these images of giants to inspire and to bring together their citizens and most importantly, to celebrate. Okay, so here we are, the oldest processional giants in the UK. This giant is called the Salisbury giant. And his, um, his tradition, basically, has been going since the 1400s, which is just incredible. But not only his tradition, but he himself. Hang on, here's a picture. So, yeah, this is a 12-foot giant. He's made of a wooden structure. He would have had a wooden head, um, probably 
carved out, but essentially, yeah, we didn't have anything else to make them out of. So wood would have been the um, thing. He's painted and he was made by the Guild of Merchant Tailors and um, they would have used him in procession. So initially he was used on a Midsummer's um, Day procession and then his sort of popularity grew and he's, um, yeah, essentially there's records of him later and later being used for more and more events. So it ended up being royal weddings, jubilees. Okay, so this little guy in the forefront is quite important. This little guy is called Hobnob and he's a hobby horse. And I, as you can see, he's also within, like enveloped within costume. He's a masked character, but he's on the level of us human beings. So it's, yeah, it's a really big part of, of the tradition where you will have somebody that's on your level as a kind of go-between. They can be used to excite the crowd. This one was used apparently quite violently. He has hobnails <laughs> within his mouth and he's apparently used to rip, um, rip the clothes of people that got in the way. So it's also clearing space. You know, these giants have got to walk, they've got to move. They need to have human beings around them that sort of watch out for them. Um, Traditionally, he was also uh, with Morris dancers and three men dressed as women, because obviously women weren't allowed to be in the parades. Is there anything else I want to tell you? Oh, yeah. So this very giant lasted until 1977, at which point he went into a museum and now replicas are used in the procession. So it's just like just such an incredibly long tradition of him. Um, yeah, of him processing through the town. Okay, let's move on to the next oldest giant. And this is Gog and Magog. So Gog and Magog, the legend um, has it, they were giants, they were captured, and they served as guardians for the city of London. Um, this procession is actually for the Lord's Mayor show, Lord's Mayor's show. Um, and so it's held the day after the Lord Mayor is sworn in and it's just an absolutely ginormous procession. It's about three miles long. It kind of, it's like a snake eating itself as it, as the, <laughs> as the procession reaches one end, it quite often hasn't left the building in which it comes out from. And included in, I mean, this is an incredibly grand procession included within it, a statesman, lords and la ladies and the guild all of the guilds, apparently, they all walk through. Um, so these giants were built in 2006 by Olivia Eaton Barrett, and she, when she became the master um, basketer um, for that guild. And it's, I want to share these guys with you because they sort of encapsulate perfectly what a com <laughs> how much giant building is very often a communal event. So here she is, and I think a woman called Jan Barker. Nine months these giants were in the making, and it was, yeah, just volunteers, professional basket makers coming every weekend to finish them off. Now, these giants, um, last thing I think to tell you about them is basically they don't move. They're really statues um, to some degree, and they're pushed along on wheels. Um, and I just wanted to share with you their most modern companions, which are these guys, giant inflatables, which, um, you know, what can you say? They pack up small and they are really big. So we'll kind of get on to storage of things in a minute. Okay, right. Let's take you on a little trip of uh, giants from around the world. So I wanted to sort of stick in a similar tradition, Belgium is absolutely nuts for giants. They have over 2,500 of these giants. Um, and it's, it's, like a, it's like a town pride thing. It's almost like they've got a motto and it's represented in the same way as we maybe have mottos. And it's represented by giants. You know, they're, they're kind of used as aspirational characters, they're used as how we celebrate, how they would celebrate the history of that specific town. Um, 
you can see they've got tiny little holes just down below you can see below the frills that's where people would have would be able to look out but you can imagine it's incredibly restrictive views and people will be in these for hours um they quite often process through the towns and they're generally in competitions they have um festivals where all of the giants from all the towns come and visit each other so it's just yeah an incredibly strong tradition um the people around them all dressed in white this is sort of part of what i was talking of before in terms of you know having humans there to hold the space around you and to give people information and help them um here's another few slightly less royal looking um and it's a really big tradition in Belgium for these giants to hold something that, that, that symbolizes them. Um, so that's a really large tradition. And I just wanted to put this one in. This is Agent 15. He's currently out of service, so my friend tells me. But um, yeah, you can see a bit of the structure coming in here. <clears throat> so it's sort of, obviously traditionally, with these, um, they would have been really our lightest uh, material that we had access to um, in, in Western countries, um, wood. And obviously he's now been covered in foam, but I think initially he would have been using hessian and horsehair. So they were really, really heavy. And traditionally, once again, the heads are carved in wood and hollowed out. Um, I imagine now they probably start using resins, but they are quite traditional giants. Okay, so sticking within the similar kind of statuesque giants, these guys are, are Spanish. And I really wanted to show you this picture, one, because this was a lovely cultural exchange that happened, I think, in the 90s, either late 80s or 90s. These are Spanish giants that came over to visit Sheffield um, and I wanted to show you this picture because right in the forefront you can see a ninny and ninnies are part of the same tradition that I was talking about they are a go-between they're quite often a fool um, their heads are generally about the same size as the giants that they are with and so yeah they um they sort of inhabit the ridiculous, but they're there on your level. So you can converse with them or be hit by them or scared by them or, you know, share a drink with them. Who knows? Okay. Um, moving on. Oh my goodness. These guys are absolutely amazing. Okay. So this is a Spanish tradition that I don't know whether it still happens in Spain. I haven't been able to find out, but it's now just huge in Mexico. And really, excuse my pronunciation. These are the Moshichancas. I'm so sorry, guys. Probably awful. But um, yeah, so these are the opposite kind of giant. These guys are pretty irreverent, to be honest. You can tell they're humoristic. They use, the fact that they are using the human being who carries them feet just gives them a kind of comedic air that, I don't know, there's something that you just can't quite take seriously. And their thing, they've kind of got one thing, and it's brilliant. They basically spin, and their arms are kind of weighted, and they spin round, and their arms swoosh out. And it's, yeah, you should watch a video of them. They're joyful. Um, I included this other little picture because there's a little boy peeking out, um, which I think sort of shows you where they are inside of themselves. And here is them on the ground. You can see once again, I don't know, I can't see close enough, but I think it's something that's basically a Withy-esque structure, but it's Mexico, so it's going to be quite different. Could be a cane of some kind. They'd be worn on the shoulders and they probably would have a strap which would then attach them around the back. So you kind of basically wait up here and you're, you know, they're only feet higher, maybe a meter or so higher than the person that's wearing them. Okay, where are we off to next? Oh, one more thing. These guys are like, they are still the coolest thing to have around. So if it's your birthday, if it's a wedding, if it's a feast day, like you totally want these guys to come and hang out and entertain your guests. So yeah, they're still really big. 
ah, these guys are so brilliant. Okay, so this is um, a wonderful tradition that's all over South Africa. These guys specifically are in Mozambique. Um, and you can see, I mean, this is a modern, this is a modern giant building tradition, which is kind of obvious when you think about it, partly because you can see there's um, these sort of much more modern poles and they're using much more modern materials that, you know, their faces, hands, etc., are made out of essentially foams. They kind of, they have got some movement in them, so there's nothing rigid. But modern also because they've stopped disguising the person, the operator and I don't know it, it's like there seems to be a point at, at time in which it became okay for us to see the operator I couldn't put an exact date on that um, but these guys it's like you, you've the thing that you've given up being the invisibility the thing that you've gained is just a whole load of movement like their legs dance like my legs um, they, yeah, they're just absolutely beautiful to watch. Once again, you guys should totally check out a YouTube video of these guys. Um, and yeah, we have the ninny tradition still going strong. And yeah, they really use ninnies over there as play, playful objects um, to dance with and to get the crowd excited. Okay. And here we have the epitome of dancing. These guys are pretty much only made for dancing. Um, as you can see, they light up. These are Spanish uh, dance troupe. These will probably be about as lightweight as a giant can ever really get. They are essentially like a power stretchy material that will boing up and down. The whole thing will kind of elastic and the hoops will just sort of, yeah, essentially be like a concertina and they light up um, and I've never seen them perform, but I think they'd probably be pretty cool. And here we have, I don't know, I think why did I include these guys? Because they're kind of the most modern looking that I've, that I've really seen. They're cartoon characters, essentially. These guys are walkabouts from Texas. And I kind of included them because they're the opposite of those amazingly statuesque giants that we saw right at the beginning coming from Belgium and the Salisbury giant, you know, and they were in proportion and they're absolutely beautiful and there's no, you know, hierarchy in my mind. But at the same time, these guys are alive in a way that those guys weren't. And it's just interesting because if you look, they've got missing parts, you know, their middles are empty. They've got, <laughs> the heads are on a stick. They're completely not a representation of a human form. Um, their feet are ginormous. And yet you can see just from this picture how much movement and life that they have. Um, so yeah, it's just interesting in terms of how you design something. Um, okay. And last but not least is this animatronic uh, grasshopper, I guess, or a cricket. I please don't, don't know which one it is. That's embarrassing. Um, okay. And I just included him because he's on a bicycle. And essentially, if you want to make extra limbs move, if you want to not carry something, um, because, you know, it's hard work, um, then this is another way that we've like sort of learned to get around it. And I, for me, on a bicycle, I'll just about accept as a giant, and this is totally a personal thing. On a vehicle, I'm just not there. It's just not a giant to me, so that's my opinion. And here we have like the epitome of giants. Um, this is Royal Deluxe, French company. Once again, um, no, I, this is just an opinion. I think they're giant puppets. And the reason why I think that is because they have operators that are external rather than internal, but it's totally immaterial. They blow your mind. And um, I can't imagine that we're ever going to get any bigger or any more lifelike in the future other than holograms, maybe. Um, yeah, these are absolutely exceptional. Um, I included this picture because I think it's interesting. You can see how much of a team effort it is. 
um, and it always is, but particularly with these guys. And also the fact that they're wearing livery. Is that the right way of saying it? Yeah. Anyway, their dress is still very, very much in the ninny tradition. Um, so I just thought, you know, these through lines, they continue. And yes, I think that's the last one of those. So another thing that giants have throughout history been used for is for politics and for political statements. You know, they're big, they get attention um, and towards very good aims. This is Amal. She is made by Handsprung um, Puppet Company. And she is, I don't think she started yet. It's a little bit hard um, to see, but she is basically going to be walking from the Turkish Syria border to Manchester. Now, Amal is based on a refugee girl who I think is eight or nine years old. So proportionately, um, that's where she sits. She's a child. And yeah, it's just absolutely beautiful project. It's going to take probably <laughs> incredibly long time to physically move from city to city. Um, she is 11 feet, which is 3.5 meters tall. And just in case you didn't know, this is the company that made the Warhorse puppets. Um, and they have been kind enough to include a sketch. Um, so she's based around stilts. And essentially, she's mainly mechanical, but she does have some electronics which help her eyes move. Um, I don't think her mouth, I think it's just her eyes. Um, yeah, and help her bring her to life. So you should try and follow her. She will, she's, it's called The Walk. And um, yeah, have a look online. This, I've included this, this is some of um, the makers at the top. We've got molds. Um, there are five of her and just in case either breakage or in case she gets arrested, you know. Um, and this arm, you can see the structure is incredibly, I don't know, it's like they've, it's like they've basically made the form and take made as much airspace as possible. It'll probably be made out of some sort of really heavy foam, um, dense foam, I mean, light, but dense. Okay, and these guys um, don't have names for them, unfortunately. Uh, they are visiting parts of the Mexican um, USA border. It's a community project. They're turning up randomly doing little bits of protesting an event against everyone's favorite fake bean. So here you go. Okay, we are out from around the world. I hope you guys enjoyed those. Um, and we are in to Cornish Giants, woo! Okay, so obviously there's lots and lots of wonderful myths and legends um, surrounding Cornish Giants, but we are gonna go stick with the processional. And strangely enough, uh, me and Zeb, <laughs> we worked it out last night. We're like, oh, all of the giants made in Cornwall were actually to do with our parents. Oh, no way. We've got like a direct through line. So these two giants I'm going to show you next. Um, Zen and Tagney's parents both were there in their inception. Here we have Bolster. This is the giant of St. Agnes. He's an absolute dude. His head looks like he's... Um, like he's actually formed out of granite. He basically fell in love with St. Agnes. It's a tragic tale, fell in love with St. Agnes. She did some, she tricked him. He basically bled himself to death uh, through a hole um, that she said he could fill. And actually he couldn't fill it because it went right out to the sea. He did had a lot of other adventures. That's just the worst one, the end. Um, so yeah, he's brought out um, by the people of St. Agnes. They do a wonderful procession. And um, yeah, I actually have never been because it's on the 1st of May and I do something else every year. But um, yeah, it looks great. And this is Tavy. So another giant legend. Um, basically, Tavy and Tamara make the rivers. So this, hang on, let me go back a bit. This procession happens in Calstock 
Um, and in the end, um, Tavi and Tamara essentially make the Tamar and the, the Tavi River. Um, that's the legend of their giants. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to move on now. Okay, here we are in to Lost with the Old Giants. So, as James said, Lost with the Old Giants have been going for 32 years, although obviously we missed the last one, but still 32 years. Here we have the original Lost with the Old Giant, who was made in Weybridge. This guy is Peter, and he is very, very scrappy, as you can see. He is essentially was made by one or two makers, very, very heavy head, crossbar, simple as. The interesting thing about him, um, is different to all the other giants, is essentially he's basically one pole. You have a kind of cup around a belt and you hold him up. Um, and so, yeah, he, what else can I tell you about him? Um, he's sort of sheet-like, tent-like. Um, it's made out of bubble wrap or it was, unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was a sort of, it's a decision that the makers went with that has really affected Lost with Your Giants. And I think you'll see as we, as we go on and I'll show you a few more. Um, but essentially it's all about movement and these really lovely hands. Um, and my mother who's playing right at the front there. And in fact, that's me with the saxophone, my bird, very cool bird mask on. Um, yeah, my mother just used to bang on about how she really loved his hands. And you'll see there's a sort of through line that, that, we've, that we've kept from Peter. So there you go. First loss with the old giant 32 years ago. Second loss with the old giant, uh, Jock, drunken Jock. Uh, he was our first attempt. Um, so this is 2010. And basically only thing to say about him is we filled him up with bin bags filled with air and he didn't last very long. His head was way too big, couldn't store him. It was, uh, it was a little bit of a disaster, but note, long arms, wiggly fingers, totally in the Lost With The Old style. Oh, and also right at the front, you can see for a little while we had, we all had these giant heads, but we realized that they're really hard work at nighttime. So we, we stopped using them, but we were essentially ninnies for the first couple of times. And then we were like, oh my God. Oh. Yeah, you need, you need to practice for that one. Um, and here we have, excuse me, I'm just going to take a sip of water. This is John. This is the first time we made a giant with the person external and visible, you can see. Now, all of these giants are built communally, unlike all of the giants that you've seen before, which are essentially much more professional giant builds. These are built two to three days actually normally in one day in the bulk of it maybe four or five people with these with these with these whilst other stuff's going on it's quite hectic there's not a through line in the terms of a design decision it's very much like oh no way we've got some spotty material cool that kind of fits the legs okay great yeah go 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 get the legs yeah 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 oh, okay cool i've just found this over here it's a hectic environment. It's not like a very, so this has been amazing. Like we've spent two days in here making the, the thing behind you, which I'll go into in a minute. But um, yeah, very, very different from the environment that the giants you've seen before would have been made in. You can see how big his head was. This guy is an incredibly tall man who from us with the, this guy is um, six foot five, I think. Brendan, the person standing there. So yeah, he had a pretty big head. Basically, we made John, he was delightful. He got caught on lots of wires as we were processing around. So you constantly have to be like, oh no, duck, duck, da, da, da. scoot forward. And um, yeah, we burned him. Well, we burned his head. And it was really good. It went up really well. It was, um, yeah, it was really good fun. We did that about two, two years after it was made. And he was made in 2016. Bada-bomb. Now we have Francis. 
Um, and I thought it's really lovely to show you these pictures. So she's made out of withies. Um, the withies are stuck together with masking tape. And this uh, picture here, this chalk drawing, that's life size. And it really helps when you're working at a large scale to be able to chalk out just to get a sense of, <laughs> it never quite is exactly what you what you've sort of aim, but it's something to aim towards rather than as a constrictive design um, idea. And it just really helps you work with scale because it's very hard to translate from a small page up into a large, in, up into a large giant. Um, and this was a kind of, this, I'm not saying that we made it up, but it was like a progression of ideas where we suddenly sort of came to the idea that actually wind is a real, really quite a large problem in giants. Um, as soon as you put sheet over a withy structure, which we're going to find out soon, you basically create a giant sail. And so that idea in combination with the fact that we actually wanted to be able to let the community really build the giant is the reason why we came to this tasseling idea so essentially it's quite difficult to have multiples of people all trying to work on something that's like really one or two bits of fabric if you're putting a piece of clothing onto a giant it's not like everyone can do that you know so before we had things like oh you guys can tassel that or you guys can add this bit to that but it was it was restrictive how much people could really properly get involved with the whole part of it and so this tasseling idea came up and we had people that were i don't know eight eight eighty to eight or nine spending just 10 minutes to four hours. Some people stay forever tasseling the heck out of Frances. Um, and she works really well. Here she is. There's Zena in the forefront um, on uh, Frances's first outing. Um, here she is on uh, after a night out in Plymouth, looking a little bit disheveled. This is her four years after I think she was made. So this is when we came and did the back alley puppets and had a joyful time. Um, yeah, first time a lot of the old giants had been across the uh, queen across the Tamar, pretty big deal. And here is some of our making. So um, yeah, we have normally decided to go down backpack route. We we started off, as you can see, actually, in the picture with me in it to, I don't know which side it is, but I'm just going to say the picture of me in it. Um, bamboo. Um, bamboo's great. Bamboo's lightweight. It works really well. Um, but one up from that, and not quite carbon, but one up from that is sort of aluminium. And essentially what you want to do when you're when you've got a giant on, you, you know, you really want to be able to deal with the weight issue. And I'll go into a bit that a bit more. But my brother here, we found some Zimmer frames. And what we worked out is essentially you can, you can kind of, here's your backpack. And then you've got this Zimmer frame and you've got something that you can also control with and share the weight with. So yeah, Zimmer frames, absolutely brilliant. I can't remember where we got that idea from. Maybe it was from our heads, but it was, yeah, it really, really has changed the way that we build giants. And it's just really interesting. <sighs> the materials that you have, the thing, the space that you have access to, all of these things are almost more important than the design you want to come up with. They really dictate how things are gonna go. Okay, um, here's Bolster's backpack. You can see that they've built out to the front as well. I think it does, it just really gives you that control. And I think that they have used carbon fiber poles. And if anyone is thinking of building a giant, then old tents. Carbon fiber is really horrible to work with, but it's amazing and lightweight. It's also quite expensive. So old tents can, um, can be quite a good solution. Um, here we have the latest one. This is the monk. 
This is the latest uh, loss with your giant. Um, and here is the monk and Francis having a good old boogie. This is at 12 o'clock. Um, so, oh, totally missed the most important thing. <laughs> loss with your giant happens at New Year's. We process through Lost with you across this beautiful old ancient bridge, which looks spectacular. And um, we end up 12 o'clock outside this pub. Um, we've got a lovely tune, got some, we've, got, uh, we've got some words. We all sing Lang, old Lang Syne. And I kind of included this picture because I really wanted to show you just how well Francis moves. And once again, it's that through line that we've tried to find. I don't know if it's purposefully or whether it's just because my mum banged on about how great the arms were so much, but long arms, you can see it's absolutely incredible. This is called, we call it Octo Arm. We don't actually know it, the, its name, but <laughs> he's got the most epitome of, of long arms I've ever seen on a giant. But um, movement and long arms, they you reach down to people you can tickle them if they're being a bit naughty you can give them a little not that i'm saying that anyone should ever be violent but she's got very soft delicate hands so you know she's sort of a little and also she's got a ring on so you know <clears throat> excuse me kiss my ring um and so yeah it's really it's fun it's something that brings you down from being this <laughs> giant people you know it's big it's something up there it can be a bit overwhelming something comes down to you you kind of you're connected there's a physicality to it okay and I think if I just go like this I think I'm gonna come out of sharing right now and see whether there is, hang on, how do I do it? There we go. Okay. Um, hello. Hello, James. Hello. <laughs> back. Back for a Hi. little bit. That was really interesting. Um, great. Guys, if you've got any questions for Zena, uh, Zena, sorry, Ruth. I'm Ruth. Uh, I've got you. But if you've got any questions for Ruth, please feel free to put them in the chat and the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. It would be really great. Um, I'll, I'll hand back to Ruth because you're about to give yourself a little break, get some water in. Just getting some water in. I've got a little yeah. like, red cheek, you can see. Um, okay, so I would now like to tell you a little bit about the giant we are currently making. So yeah, this is the first loss with your giant to be made off of the hallowed soil of loss with your itself. <gasps> The Barbican Theatre in their wisdom have decided that they want their own giant. And um, we thought about it. We came up with quite a few ideas and the fisherman giant stuck. He's called the fisherman giant because I've made a decision. I'm not naming him. He will find his name. We're running workshops. So I'm imagining it's probably going to happen within that. But I, it's just another thing of like attachment. Like, okay, I'm making him, we're bringing him to life, me and Zena are bringing him to life, but there's a point at which he's not mine or Zena's anymore. And I, I imagine that will be the point in which he finds his name. Um, so, yeah, I've been taking photographs of the procedure that um, we've gone through in making him. So I can basically run you through from the beginning. Let me go back into screen sharing and this is going to take me a moment. Um, right, so we've got beginning point, although it's actually not quite the beginning point because I did do a drawing, but I'm not going to show that to you. Um, so beginning point, uh, as you can see, chalking him out on my rather dirty floor. Um, should have swept that up. But anyway, so yeah, chalking him out. I did it on the floor because actually you can then build on top of your chalking marks, which is really, really helpful. So it's essentially, you know, 
that's that kind of egg shape I want to get. That's that kind of round circle. And once again, I'm never doing anything. It's just not the way that I work. You totally can. I'm never doing anything to like, I'm drawing it. That's exactly where it's going to be. Because actually, I haven't even told you about Wizzies yet. I'm always a person that jumps ahead. I'm pretty certain you know what withies are. Um, I've mentioned them a few times now, but withies are willows. And they, um, the ones that we're using are buff willows. We buy them from Somerset, um, Somerset willows. You soak them. Um, they come in lots of different sizes. You soak them for, depends, can be like, four or five days, it can be quite a long time. Um, that's one of your major missions to discover right at the beginning is how on earth you soak a six foot thing under some water. Um, I used farmer's black plastic, basically kept on like filling it up with bowls and bowls and sort of made some sort of enveloped container to try and, because, you know, Essentially, loads of these things are down to practicalities. Um, the very fact that we've got this giant workspace has meant that we can work in a completely different way to I've ever been able to work before. So with these and bamboo, mainly because one, they're natural um, and it's absolutely, they're lovely to work with. Two, they're not the most top end <laughs> things you can get a lot more precision with something like center cane, but then that's come all the way from India. Um, and the costs go up. Um, so I don't know, everything in design is that kind of interplay in between perfection and your reality. And sometimes that's practical, sometimes it's cost-based. So with these are really, viable and relatively relatively cheap source this whole giant and he is a big one um biggest one we've ever built so this whole giant is about 30 to 40 pounds worth of withies um couple of bundles essentially okay I think I've said enough about withies now. I don't want to say the word ever again. Um, yeah, so it's soaked up. You do some bending over your knee quite often. Like uh, uh, uh. You want to basically get the fibers moving, um, sort of break them down a little bit. And then once you started doing that, you can then essentially make whatever you form you like, depending on what your manual dexterity is and also what the withy decides to do, because they do kind of have a bit of a mind of their own to some degree. They're not this absolutely perfect thing. In fact, I'm just going to get up and show you one. Excuse me. But you can see this one's a very, very, very thin one, but they start off thick. That one's already got a natural bend and they go to very, very, very fine at that end. So you've got a material that has incredibly different properties, one side to the other. Um, and so you, as a maker, you kind of utilize that. This side's kind of more for bending round and round and round and sort of fastening. This side's your strength. So, Soaked withies and masking tape. And that's pretty much your basic. Um, giants are also a lot to do with lashing. So if you see at the center um, of, the, of the head, you can see that there's these, this basically cross, like noughts and crosses um, that I've made. Um, these are pretty thick bamboos and I've drilled through them and essentially used a combination of either um, cable ties going through the drill hole, but you don't want to drill very many times through bamboo. So it's cable tie and then also lashings. And to be honest, I'm a bit 
I'm a nervous builder, so I do quite a lot of drilling and cable tying, so it makes me feel, but I think actually, to be honest, you can just get away with lashing. Um, right, goodness me, I'm gonna move on. So next we have um, essentially wet strength, white tissue paper. Once again, you can get this from Mosgrove's where I feel like I'm advertising them now. <laughs> you can get this from certain willow growers that you buy the willow from. And it's incredible. Um, use it with PVA and you can actually, you can actually completely soak it in PVA, bring it out, squeeze it dry, open it up and sort of shape it over your, over the shape that you're trying to you're trying to make um and yeah it dries taut it sort of stretches out um yeah this has only got essentially about two to three layers of this on um and then it's i mean you know obviously you can pierce through it with 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 something if you um if you're not careful but it's incredibly strong, incredibly light. Um, doesn't have any really much flexibility anymore. You lose all the flexibility, it becomes quite hard. And um, what else can I tell you about it? I don't think I can tell you anything else about it. That's about it. And then you move on to the fun bit, which is like coloring in. So yeah, this tissue paper is a run resistant. Um, so it's, it's not got the strength of the original tissue paper, but it essentially, um, yeah, it, if you use tissue paper, if you use kind of quite average tissue paper that you maybe buy from a, from a normal stationery shop, it can run in the rain. So this has just got a slightly better dye um, put onto it. So yeah, we, we've been making these giants. So this is now whatever, this is the one, two, three, third fourth head that we've made in this way gradually we've sort of developed a style you can no notice that I've kind of I wanted to keep within the tradition that seems to be forming it's unconsciously forming but it still seemed really important to honor that um, and it's slightly it's going slightly down the cartini route um, there's some precision in it even though it's quite free form um, and yeah it seemed to be all really big about eyes. So with this, I've actually been quite precise in terms of like actually cutting out proper shapes and sticking them on to get that sort of graduated iris that you can see. Um, other parts, I've been a lot more free form and just ripping up the tissue paper and sort of, but uh, yeah, I like it like that. Yeah, slap that on. Okay, have a look, stand back, that kind of process. But there's points at which, and you can see actually, I, I, I can show you on the original behind me. Um, but yeah, there's points at which I really am actually cutting very thin little strips just to bring out detail. This giant, I've had to think about slightly differently because of the time of year that we're going to be possessing him. It's not going to be dark. Um, so actually... <laughs> Normally this sort of willow tissue works really well in the dark. You put a light inside it, it shines out. You saw in those pictures, they, they glow. Um, this one, we probably will still put a light inside him because it, it can help and it, we might hit twilight, but essentially I've had to work on the detail in a way that, it, it, not that you don't work on the detail, but you work on it differently because as soon as the light shines through from the back, it just, it picks out all the withies essentially. So you've got all these lovely lines, which we probably won't get in a daytime procession quite so much. So I've had to work on his detail a little bit more and you can see I've sort of highlighted certain ones just to bring it up. Currently, as you can tell, he is missing a hat, some eyebrows and a beard. So we've got, still got quite a lot of work to do. Um, right, let's click on to the next one. Oh, goodness me, <laughs> loads and loads of eye detail. Totally should have moved that on. There you go. That's the eye, de eye detail I was talking about up 
close. Um, and here we have the beginning of the building process. So here we have the lovely glamorous Zenitagni. And can I move me? Yes, I can. Oh my goodness, I've been wanting to move me for ages. <laughs> uh, great. Really just learning how to do this. Um, okay, so basically the head was made, I made the head um, about, uh, yeah, I think that's about three days, not three full days work, but three days worth of, you know, coming back because you have to wait for drying times. So once again, it's always just the interaction of the practical. So I made the head um, in my workshop in Exeter. I've brought it down. And this is the first time that it's basically interacting with the backpack, which I had, I didn't have access to when I made the head. So what we're doing here is essentially we're trying to work out where the scale of him and where um, his shoulders are going to be. So the top, the top one is his shoulders. The next the next pole you can see that's, you know, horizon line poles is his armpits. And the next one is where we wanted his tummy, his widest point to sit. And so we spent quite a lot of time basically pushing these poles up and down. We're like, okay, can you imagine? Is that the right kind of dimensions? Um, so yeah, that was sort of number one part of the process. After we'd done that, once again, it was back onto the ground and we were doing sort of chalking it out. Um, so yeah, chalking it out, trying to find the right shapes. And then basically that is gonna give you the widths of which you wanna make your hoops. So essentially you're taking, um, taking a width dimension and then chump, straight across and then you know that that's the outermost point of your circle that you want to create um, your hoops or your withies. Um, the hoops, the withies, what we're doing with them is essentially hanging them as you can see. And they're all hung together. You can use string. Um, this is quite strong stuff. This is a uh, scrap store special, um, the ends of netting. And, you know, you can get as exact as you want, but essentially you're, you're, you're tracking down the width of your giant. We're going for quite a complex shape. You know, he's got a bit of an hourglass figure as our fisherman. He's eaten a lot of pies. And, um, yeah, you're building the hoops ours aren't circular but you're building the hoops essentially at incremented um we think we've got about we're about 10 to 15 centimeters in between each one um then we had to think about the shoulders so this is like the point at which everything's hanging from so this is yeah Strength, strength-wise, this is like your next, your next most crucial build, other than the backpack. Um, you can see here we're sort of gradually. This is us playing around with the shape. So we've kind of put put in some shoulder poles. We've decided that we wanted to create a really nice. It, it means you've got another piece. You've got a head, <laughs> a shoulder piece a whole entire load of body and a backpack. But just to give him that shape and strength at the top, we've decided to make a separate piece up here. Um, and we're playing here in these pictures, we're basically playing around with the hoops and we keep all of the hoops on, um, on just slip knots. So you're like up a bit, down a bit. Oh God, it's gone wonky. Okay, okay. And so you can, so it's very hard from lying down to standing up you know, things look different, your perspective's all different. So you can shimmy it around and help it find its shape. So that's what we're up to here. Here he is lying down. I just wanted to include that one because he looks great and he looks like he's going to sleep and snoring. 
And also this picture here at the bottom is the beginning of this sort of, it's like rather American, uh, what are they call football <laughs> shoulders. Um, but yeah, essentially this sort of barrel, which lifts on and off that we've created with withies and with bamboo. Very importantly here, I don't know if you guys can see that well, but is triangulation, um, triangulation within the structure. That's the thing that will always give you strength. Um, so that one's triangulated in both dimensions this way to stop it from doing that and that way to stop it from doing that. So that's like probably that's if you think about it, that's like the only rigid thing that we've got going on. We've got two verticals and a horizontal. You get them sorted, you get them so that they're rigid, so that they won't move, and then everything else can be fluid off of them and you don't have to worry about it. But yeah, it's really important to have that cross piece in really, really solidly, and then everything else can flow from that. And here we have the lovely James. So you can see we essentially, we've, we've used a bit of plastic <laughs> to cover the top because it's gonna give it a really, really nice shape up here. And we've started to attach the arms on. Um, and here we have James actually modeling, modeling the Fisher Giant for us. Um, and um, yeah, I think we're up to, seven o'clock so i'm wondering whether james you want to come back hey, in at this point hey. <laughs> here he is I'm with my, my mug on the screen you're looking uh, a bit shorter but you know yeah a lot shorter yeah <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all in the upper lower torso <laughs> um great that's amazing thank you so much for sharing that and um and thank you i'm so glad that my face is looking so gaping at that and that photo that's hilarious i'm so sorry but it was the best photo <laughs> uh, it's fine that, that's the most important thing my vanity can wait um that's no problem at all. um it really really great really interesting um you can stop sharing the screen so uh, we can get oh big. yeah if you yes can, stop please. screen sharing that thing Yay. Yay. Cool. Did it. Got, that's great because then we can also see it in the background um yes. i've got i've got a couple of questions one's come through from well, someone's been watching Tony, he's asking about the willow and how some, would you take advantage of kind of the imperfections in some of the willows or how would you work, how then if you are going to, which you are, how do you like decide that to fit in with a design you might have done before? How do you work with that? Good question. Yeah, I mean, the, hmm, the willows are grown so they are pretty straight. Like, when we're talking imperfections, we're talking sort of little kinks or whatever. But essentially, they're still, they're a bit of a gift, really, unless you've only got two left and you really don't want them to be doing what you're doing. But essentially, if you've got one that's got a lovely big sort of bow shape at the bottom, unfortunately, all the ones I've got left are totally straight because I've used all the nice bow shaped ones. Then essentially, that tells me it wants to bend in that direction or if I've got a sort of sharper corner that I know that I want to go around and the willow is already giving me that shape, then it's just a natural twinning mm -hmm. of it. Um, so yeah, I'm not the world's best willow worker, but the only thing that I really grasp from this is it's a relatively forgiving material, but as much as you can go with it and listen to it, the better it will behave for you. Um, so yeah, I think that's about as good as I can give really. No, that's great. That's really interesting. Um, guys, if you want to throw more questions in, please do. I'm going to carry on this line of questioning though, because I've got a question to ask around. Obviously we're using kind of from Lost Women, we're using scrap store material and then a mixture of obviously some bought material just for a bit of design work. How do you, obviously with communities, it's kind of, bit of creation but why would you use scrap stuff as well as for how do you find the right balance between that hmm. okay um i think there's a million different answers to that so i can only really speak personally uh that's what we want Your personal totally. um i but also personally i probably respond really differently um <laughs> depending on who's approaching me so I would say that there is an utter joy in recycling and that is like a number one thing 
for me anyway. So I am inclined to go down that route if I possibly can. And James would be aware of this. I kept on being like, James, we could just find some sheets and we can dye them. Like, would, don't we need, can't, doesn't someone just have some sheets that we can dye? <laughs> Instead, what we've done is this time, we've actually got some incredibly, incredibly, look at this, bright yellow sheets, which we actually brought brand new because, <sighs> okay, this time, we are actually really designing a giant. He has an image it, on a piece of paper. We've decided he's a fisherman. We want him to wear bright yellow fisherman clothes. So that's like a joy, a gift. And it's also a massive restriction. It means I can't just walk into somewhere and be like, oh, cool, there's some sparkly stuff. So I, I'm now looking for yellow things. And especially right now where nothing's open, it's a massive restriction. So, you know, it's like design wise, these things are really interesting. As soon as you put one little bit of, mm, it has to be that, it sort of sets this chain in motion. Mm, yeah. And everything has to, you, that means you have to buy that thing, which then means it has to take that much time, which then, it's either that or it's kind of free form. And if it's free form, it's like, I've got a whole load of fabric that's, that's there on the floor and um, hopefully it will fit. Um, if not, we'll make it fit. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, yeah, this project has been really different because it isn't, it isn't free form. We have actually had a chance um, and be lucky enough to think it through as much as you can um yeah so it's going to be really interesting to see how he turns out because he's had yeah he's had so much more time and a little bit more money than we averagely mm. spend on a giant yeah. so yeah <laughs> and i guess that's the thing when you're building say a smaller puppet sometimes you can really take what you find in the scrap store and that works perfectly and it can have the same but when it's a giant you're covering so much material and so much space it absolutely. becomes the challenge becomes so much bigger absolutely yeah. and yeah top tip sheets mm. yeah. like if anyone wants to build a giant giant because you get width in a way that you don't with average material and plus it's much cheaper and you know you can also dye them uh, <laughs> Hey, <laughs> I, I love, I, I, do you know, there's part of me that's gutted we didn't die because I was just thinking it'd be hilarious to have a tie-dye fisherman. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, like, would be great. Um, I really feel like I should have shown you a drawing of what he's going to turn into now, but hey-ho, he's still a mystery. Well, yeah, I think let's give you the mystery a bit, you know. Great. Like, make these people come and keep an eye out on all the other stuff we'll be publishing about in the build-up. <laughs> I was, I was going to talk about just because we haven't had any questions in but feel free to put them in like when we were doing the puppet you were talking about the arm length and I think it's quite interesting because as not as a puppet maker but a puppeteer we were looking you were looking at the arms and I sort of went and then we were looking at them and you went oh no they're too short and I went actually no but they're kind of like what a humanoid should be they're down to the knees and you're like no but you sort of touched this about in your presentation but do you want to talk through really why that was kind of a important yeah. to you because we only moved it about a foot didn't we it wasn't much it wasn't much yeah okay so i'm gonna stand up um so obviously obviously i'm a human <laughs> and i've got an incredibly average human body um i'm not at all short and uh yeah my basically mid thigh is where my hands come down but then at the same time i don't have a giant head this guy has a giant head He's got a head that's much larger. He's going to be seen in a way that you see tall buildings. Actually, it's pretty good when you're on a camera, isn't it? We had the same thing happens to us. Essentially, <laughs> this is what he'd look like if I kept him in proportion. And actually, I want him to look a bit more like this. Mm -hmm. I know I'm not quite talking about hands yet, but there's also, hey, actually, God, this is brilliant. Okay, I'm basically a giant now. <laughs> Guys, you imagine I'm a giant. <laughs> and I'm at the moment, I'm up here. I might be dancing. I might be moving around. But essentially, 
I'm kind of unreachable unless the person inside of me decides to put their back out and have a lot of fun and bend right over, in which case I'm in your face. I can't keep this up as a puppeteer for very long. These guys are lightweight, but it's still not much fun ever. In fact, kids never do this at home. Never, <laughs> never do not ever bend forward. Always use your knees. So um, here we are. Like, this is my connection point. This is my connection point. And especially if it's nice and floppy, this is like something that means that I'm no longer just this giant gaunt mess of a, oh, just really tall and big. It's, you know. So essentially what I've done is elongated his arms. He's now completely out of proportion. So his arm is basically, if I was him, it's probably just about past his knee. But he's not at full height right now. And even then, I'm only going to be able to reach out to here, you know, and I really, if I'm full height, I kind of basically in my head, I want to be able to reach a five-year-old and I want that five-year-old to be able to shake my hand if it wants to. Um, <laughs> so yeah, essentially four or five-year-old and that's, if, if I can't reach down and interact and play with them then for me that's kind of missing a bit of a missing a bit of tricks so yeah. A bit, yeah a bit of the magic well yeah, it's great absolutely because it's like i don't know like i know what it's like to be that five-year-old it's pretty cool when you're an adult but when you're like five and everybody else is a giant anyway and then a giant wants to shake your hand it's like you can see their faces. It's like a bit mind blowing. <laughs> oh yeah, it was one, it was one of the joy, most joyous things. And even when you're inside it, I say I was carrying the monk for the puppetry parade. And when you're inside it, you've seen these young kids just staring up, and it's quite nice because you've become invisible for a bit. And it's like you're putting all your energy for this big. Totally. That's one thing we haven't really talked about. And actually, like I've never got to be a giant because I'm too. Oh. I'm such a weak woman. <laughs> And they've all been so heavy. You're not. You're not <laughs> a two. <laughs> strong girl. Um, strong girl. So that's my friend's child who does that. As her, so that's an in-joke. Um, <laughs> for someone that isn't watching. Uh, <laughs> perfect. So, yeah. But it's something we haven't talked about. And that is masked states. Okay, this mm. isn't a mask. But it is essentially. It's a ginormous, huge extension of yourself and of your being if you want it to be you know he's only going to be what you help him to be you you yeah. are the puppeteer you're bringing him to life you you know you submit to him on some level but also he submits to you and you you become yeah. one so you've got that going on and you've also got lack of vision <laughs> You've got noise. You've got, what the hell is that? Where are my feet? Why is nobody, why is my left arm going around there? Because the arms are always carried by other people and we mm. keep it like that because it's, you can make puppets where it's one person, but it's kind of more communal. It's, it's got that, it's got a random element to it. <laughs> and yeah. so you've got all that going on. And essentially that puts you in a really odd state. Mm. you know where you don't uh, the world is 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 quite is this correct james i think it's quite an amazing state to be in it's yeah it is hyper aware but well it's when you're inside because obviously when you have two people and they're guiding you because you really can't see that much you're really keeping on the idea especially when we did the back alley puppetry was there's cobbles yeah. on the floor i do not want to make a fool of myself and fall over i ended up doing that in the park instead but you know let's not go there but no it is and it is but it's also i think there's some joy in the fact um because i've seen the puppets where it's a single puppeteer and i've also puppeteered like that and that is really a fun thing to do because you can literally pure control you can do so much beautiful finessing but there's such a lovely working with a team is great because you're shouting commands at each other and it's also quite funny because then you can have moments where your arm gets left behind and you can as the center puppeteer like have fun of being like oi get up here <laughs> what, what are you doing and as an arm, you have loads of fun of being like, let's run around in circles. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah. 
go, 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 go. Yeah, they were fun right at the beginning. After an hour of carrying them, mate, uh, if you're in the centre, you're going, yes, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> okay, um, note to all arms out there. <laughs> Only push it so far. <laughs> when towards the end, limited finessing is much appreciated. Um, and you know, yeah. we've um, we've been doing, you know, these are absolutely lovely performances, and this next one's going to be fantastic. But we've been doing events that are like daytime and children and you know, there's a whole other world that comes into it as soon as you're not um, with that. And yeah, a lot of mask work, I mean, is essentially you're going into this state and quite often, so Lost With Your Giants, that's at New Year's, you need a bit of alcohol to basically get you through. And I think that that's quite a common thing within the world of when we inhabit other beings and we do like essentially you need sugar like you're mm. carrying something you are projecting out um so yeah it's, it's probably not uncommon <laughs> to no. find this that you need you need sort of topping up basically yeah. to keep your energy going because you, you come people come out of there and they are sweating buckets on a full yeah. day so it's a big I thing to do I, th I think it's because you are having to project and it's about the anarchy of the puppet and you wanted to do it justice that you want to keep that energy up so that's why you are having to put so much into it but mm -hmm. when you put the puppet on like you were saying earlier they have their own personalities it's quite good fun for when we put that on even though it's we're really just trying stuff out that I was instantly trying stuff out and we found that kind of like the shake works really well doesn't it and totally. like, this one does like a Homer Simpson belly dance he's like mm -hmm. yeah, he's, yeah. I think we're going to tie his legs and that's something that's quite interesting that you I've like I've only experimented with this a little bit but essentially if you imagine if you tie these a bit stiller mm. then you've got all of this like <laughs> movement whereas if you've got yeah so you've got loads of points in which you can use restriction I mean you could do really freaking weird things I've never done it but you essentially you could make <laughs> um so yeah, this guy is all about the tummy. Oh, hips. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna be a big I'm hoping we can get some of that going. Um that's a bit weird to do that in front of the camera. <laughs> um <laughs> what can I say? Uh, yeah, so that's um that's gonna be his movement, I think, but you're gonna find loads more than that. Yeah. And that was like number one, wasn't it? As soon as you got into it, it was like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like the most natural. And then you, that's what you think you find the most natural thing. Say, like the monk, I always felt like it was the head forward run, like because he's got this lovely head that pushes forward. I found yes. that as a lovely, like, it's got an extended head, head. It? It's like, again, it's about finding that. And I wonder, as a designer, do you ever go in going, maybe less, well, in puppetry or just in general, do you ever go in going, actually, this puppet really needs that one movement, so I'm going to focus on that? Or do you ever? It's always a bit of a surprise when you build something, what the puppeteer or what people find in its movement vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to have to say it's both. <laughs> yeah, that's um, great. <laughs> just because there are, you know, in my theatre work, I'm designing and it's going to do that. Mm. Which does not mean that obviously people bring life and character and they find, you know, extra things that, that can that can be done but essentially you're you know within that kind of realm you're going backwards and forwards here try this out okay oh it moves like this I like that bit therefore you're working together in the best in the best times yeah, sometimes yeah. you're just making it on your own and going there you go <laughs> uh, <laughs> hope that works um but you know in the best times it's a it's a reciprocal conversation and so therefore you're basically evolving it together something like this far more about the random and far more about the you you know you're only going to be in him as a performer probably two three times tops and you're going to have a good hour maybe <laughs> tops to play so there's going to be so much random that happens within that and you're probably still going to be discovering things at the end of the procession and then you'll be like okay now i know what i want to do next time so yeah 
this will have an element of random and lots of community stuff really yeah. does essentially okay. yeah okay i'm good oh sorry you can carry on no 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 i just wanted to say two really important things yeah. i totally forgot to say and that's number one is storage like essentially it doesn't matter like this head is the size it is because it had to fit out of my door and go in my van like you've done you can design the heck out of anything like there are practical limits as all tech techie people know and uh that's that's how something has to has to evolve it's you know it's the dream plus the reality and there's beauty in that and if you do not pay attention to the reality then things don't work very 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 clear and so storage though like we've built giants we've had to strap them to the tops of sheds like we've now found somewhere to store it but essentially loads of these things fail and you don't get to keep them or da -da 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 because they take up space and that's why this one is flat pack um and next factor wind once again yeah. practicality wind giant sail just can't say that enough <laughs> it you know and yeah i think that's something really special within um this kind of work and all kind of outdoor work is that element of the reality of the world in which you're bringing them into so we're not in a controlled theater environment anymore you know we're actually having to be in the world so yeah and I, th and I think that's interesting to say back alley puppetry obviously it was designed to be covid safe so people are away and we mm. lost and that's what and but also you did have a bit of protection and as someone who was in a monk who's similar designed it when you got to the end the wind slightly picked up and you really suddenly felt it it's, yeah i think you're tired anyway but then that really and it i was just we were talking about it earlier when you're using say bed sheets and stuff is there simple ways to deal with it or is it something you just got to mitigate and go look it's gonna be bad weather it if there's such bad wind we're just gonna have to say it's too yeah, tall and, to and we have to work around degree, i think you're right to some degree like you just you can't take them out in high winds that it depends who you are obviously as an organization there's a level of responsibility when we're doing it in Lost With You, we might be more willing to try it and have a take a chance and like, okay, all right, all right, we, you win, win. But, you know, <laughs> but yeah, um, essentially holes, uh, more porous material. Uh, these sheets are quite thin, but they will be really sail like. But if you can get your hands on anything that has um, like power net, like those, those the ones that were lit up the spanish ones that essentially bounce they that kind of material is really good but holes um making things with strips literally cutting holes inside it it's ridiculous but it really does make a difference and we might end up having to do that on this guy i am we, we this is the largest capacity bulk we've ever given them any giants so yeah we might yeah. we might end up having to make some holes in him <laughs> Well, well, we'll see how it goes. I think we're going to leave it there. So thank you so much, Ruth. That was so insightful and brilliant and oh, great. And I'm sure everyone had a great time. Oh, uh, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for staying with us, enjoying this. Yes. It's been really great to have you involved. Again, we've got more of these masterclasses coming up. But the most important thing is to say is in May, this is when this puppet is going out on parade and there's other chance to get involved in the building of some other puppets that are going to be involved in this parade. And that will be happening in May. So keep an eye on Barbican website because the workshops will go on live there and you can sign up. There's going to be limited capacity because it's COVID and so stay safe out there. Uh, but keep an eye on our website because we, you will get to meet Ruth and Zena in person and build puppets together with them. And it's going to be fabulous. Um, I think- yeah, Thank you so much all for coming. And um, I hope one day you build a giant. And thank you, James, and thank you, Barbican, for looking after us so well and for inviting us to make such wonderful work in this time. That's no, no problem. <laughs> Lovely to see you all. Keep all safe. If you feel that you can donate, please donate. Last, last minute plug. And we hope to see you all very, very soon. Bye. Mm -hmm.